Welcome to the EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Rupneet Lali and we will be discussing the module on history and philosophy of punishment. The learning objectives of this module are to be able to understand the development of punishment, to be able to differentiate between the different philosophies of punishment and the third objective of this module is to examine the different approaches of punishment with their pros and cons. It is said by Sir Winston Churchill that the mood and temper of the public concerning the treatment of crimes and criminals is one of the most unfailing tests of civilization of any country. And this he said while addressing the House of Commons. The justification of punishment is one of the most difficult jurisprudential issues. There are of course different theories of punishment which have been prevalent in different ages and the different justifications that have been offered amongst different countries according to the variations in culture and also civilizations. Punishment has been imposed by societies since a very long time and it has had a very sordid past. It has ranged from banishment and fines in ancient Greece to torturous physical punishment during the Inquisition, the implementation of the death penalty in the 17th century England. Following that, there have been rehabilitative practices which were utilized both in Britain and US into the 20th century, which has also noticed an excessive use of incarceration, particularly in countries like USA. Thus, the concept of punishment has evolved over centuries and has drifted from retribution to rehabilitation and reformation and correction. Ironically, and you, we find that punishment has been fueled by activities of deviants and criminals where society felt compelled to fashion and sustain a so suitable and an appropriate social control mechanism to deal with crimes. Now, how do we define punishment? Bean has stated that punishment can be seen through the lens of sanction, which is imposed upon an individual for a criminal offense. And it is made up of five specific elements. First, the sanction must be perceived as unpleasant to the victim. Second, the sanction must only be for an actual or an alleged offense. Third, the sanction must be of an offender, actual or supposed. And then the sanction must be handed out by personal agencies and the sanction must not be a natural cause or consequence of the criminal action. The sanction must be carried out by the state. In other words, the authority and the institution that the offense is committed against shall be the one to carry out the sanction. So it's not lynching. Newman in 2008, when building on the definition provided by HLA Hart, defines punishment as punishment must involve pain or unpleasant consequences. Second, Punishment must be a sanction for an offense against a specific rule or law. And third, punishment must be executed upon the specific offender who has allegedly or actually committed the crime. And fourth, it must be administered intentionally by someone other than the offender. The philosophies and justifications of punishment what are they? What is a philosophy? Philosophy involves defining the concept of punishment, the values, the attitudes, the beliefs contained in that definition. Most clearly, it involves justifying the imposition of a painful burden on unwilling subjects. Kelson, in his general theory of law and state, described sanction as is socially organized, consists in deprivation of possession, life, freedom or property. Various philosophers, legal scholars and criminologists have traditionally identified four major objectives or justifications for the practices of punishing criminals and these are retribution, deterrence, rehabilitation and incapacitation. Criminal justice scholars have recently added the fifth purpose in the list which is reintegration. Now to understand the history of punishment, we look at the historical approaches to crime and criminals 
which has undergone a tremendous change. According to Mueller, punishment has undergone four distinct eras. The era of retribution, which was the era of revenge, of repression and rejection. The utilitarian era, which was one of rehabilitation and reintegration. The era of humanism. The era of nihilism, which stated that nothing ever works. Now, the main punishments in the Roman Empire were execution, exile, corporal punishments, imprisonment and fines. And we found that the method of execution, which included burning, stoning, crucifixion and hanging from a large fork until the person got dead or persons being thrown to the animals. And crucifixion was the method of execution for slaves and low ranking foreigners. Even the Bible listed three methods of execution and these were stoning, burning and decapitation. In fact, stoning was very commonly used for crimes that affected the well-being of the whole society, including sex crimes. In Roman law, the criminal justice was administered promptly, but the history of penal action in the Roman system was highly obscure. In all ancient societies, the lex talonis the law of retaliation, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth prevailed. Even the ancient Hebrew code, the code of Hammurabi, which is dating back to 2000 BC in Babylon, and the law of 12 tables in Rome, mention different aspects of retribution. Retribution is probably the oldest and most ancient justification for punishment and which is that a wrong is made right by an offender's receiving his just deserts. Get even with, that is the spirit with which uh, retribution occurs, where the general public feels that the criminal gets the punishment, gets the suffering that the person deserves. Corporal punishment is a punishment of the body and the most common methods have been flogging, mutilation and amputation. Historically, corporal punishment was reserved for the poor, the slaves, and often carried out in public. Flogging continues even today in places such as Singapore, where it is still applied in criminal acts. In Iran and Saudi Arabia, flogging is still utilized as a criminal punishment. Branding was first used by Babylonians as a way of not only punishing criminals, but also warning the others. And finally, imprisonment, although it has been used as a punishment since ancient times, today it is one of the most common ways of dealing with offenders who have been uh, facing instead of execution or corporal punishment. It's only in 18th century that we find that a gradual reversal of the trend of corporal punishment began and the European penal system came into existence. Michael Fockelt in Discipline and Punishment examine how the rise of prisons in the 18th century contributed to the formation of the modern worldview. Vicaria, from 1738 to 1794, published a book called On Crimes and Punishment. That reason that for radical reform of the punishment system and ending torture and capital punishment and the adoption of punishment that was swift, proportionate to the crime. In the Islamic law, there are crimes with specific punishments. Crimes whose punishment is at the judge's discretion, the tazir, and crimes that deserve retaliatory action, kisas, inflicted by the victim's family or blood money paid by the offender or his family, crimes against the policy of the state deserving administrative penalties. That is known as siyasa and crimes that are corrected by acts of personal penis or expiation, kafara. Punishments may be either death by stoning, fines, lashes, amputations. The classical Hindu law writers or Simritikars base their penal thesis on the same principle that is an eye for an eye. It is prescribed that with whatever limb a man of law, low caste or a law Defend, uh, commits an offense against Brahmins, that very limb of his should be cut off. But the deterrent aspect of punishment was also another important purpose. This aspect it was highlighted in Kautalya's Arthashastra and the Satapada Brahmana. Manu also said that if the king does not scrupulously employ Danda, 
the strong would torment the weak. Dandaniti or criminology is contained in the Dharmshastras such as the Vedas. In the works of Bana, there is indirect reference to crimes, rigorous imprisonment, amputation of limbs and also execution. The Samriti writers were aware of the complexity of human nature and they paid due attention to the individuality of an offender in punishing him. Manu said that considering the inclination in the offender, his antecedents and capacity, punishment should be given. According to Brihaspati, a gentle admonition should be given to a man for a light offence. Kautalya advised the king to award punishment which should neither be mild nor severe. During Maurya rulers, particularly in the reign of Ashoka, a new official known as Dharma Mahamantra was appointed, who was to look after, among other matters, the prisoners in jail. Thus punishment in classical theories were based upon punitive, deterrent and exclusional objectives. The modern theories of punishment, philosophers and penologists have over the years advanced diverse explanations or justifications for punishment. Changes in the social structure of society have also resulted in various punishment theories. Radical changes in punishment theories from the traditional to the modern level are being seen. In fact, modern penologists prefer to classify theories of punishment under the following five categories. First is retributive theory, second is deterrent theory, then we have the preventive theory and the fourth theory is of reformation, the fifth theory is expiation. The IPC that is the Indian Penal Code and the Criminal Local and Special Laws are combinations or compromise between the underlying principles of all these theories. Retribution is a term that means balancing a wrong through punishment. While revenge is personal and not necessarily proportional to the victim's injury, retribution is impersonal and balanced. Retributive theory is based on rights, desert and justice. The guilty deserve to be punished and no moral consideration relevant to punishment outweighs the offender's criminal desert. It's a philosophy of retributive theory. Retributive theory replaces private punishment by institutionalizing punishment on the structure of law and state in organized manner. Punishment is believed to be an essential feature of civilization. The state takes over the act and revenge and elevates it to something noble rather than base, something that is proportional rather than unlimited. Immanuel Kant, who discussed the concept of punishment in the first half of the metaphysics of morals, and for him just actions are deducted, deduced from the concept of morals and punishment, should satisfy the rationality of morality and justice. Guilt is a sufficient condition for justifying punishment. For Kant, human being is a free man and enjoys rights in the legal system based on the dignity of humanity. When any person interferes with the other's right, he forfeits and gives up his own right and submits him to others. Interference in his life as legitimate. Immanuel Kant supported a retributive rationale. He held the belief that punishment inflicted neither benefits the criminal nor the society, but the sole and sufficient reason for inflicting punishment is the evil doer facing the evil. He did the evil and he suffered the evil. Earlier penologists and criminologists advocated for punishment with the sole aim of inflicting pain on the offender. The proponents of the retributive theory sought only to punish the offender. It was hoped that by inflicting pain on the offender as a repressive means allowed or stipulated, both the offender and the entire society in general would be deterred. 
punishment thus began to be seen as that which should not only be retributive, but also produce the desired effect upon both the offender and also the society in general. This saw the evolution of utilitarian theories, markedly those of reformation, incapacitation or restraint, and reintegration. The focus shifted from the offence to the offender. It was argued that the offenders did not necessarily have a criminal mind, but that other factors led to criminality. Retribution under the Judeo-Christian religious tradition offers a divine justification for strict sanctions and it clearly fits the popular notions of justice. He got what he was getting for. The retributive rationale for punishment holds that because of natural law and the social contract, society has the right to punish and the criminal has the right to be punished. It is not an evil to be justified, but rather represents the natural order of things. According to Newman, there is little grace in punishment, only justice. Now the critique of this retributive theory. Retribution is a, as a penal philosophy, it has been criticized on several fronts when it is actually applied in practice. It is criticized as being overly rigid, especially in societies that recognize degrees of individual culpability and also blameworthiness. The, secondly, the principle of rex, lex talonis has limited applicability. Under these conditions, a retributive sentencing system that espouses proportional sanctions would be based on the erroneous assumption that there is public consensus in the rankings of the moral gravity of particular types of crime. It focuses more on criminal, his guilt, sufferings and his feelings which are likely to glorify them. There is a total rejection of claims of victims of crime, potential victims and potential criminals. This undermines the nature of criminal law. This theory focuses on what had happened but does not on focus on what has to be done in the future for preventing, prevention of crimes because sometimes punishment ought to be considered as a means to an end. Another criticism is retribution does not in fact serve the purpose of vengeance but it becomes an outlet for anti-social aggressiveness. According to Professor Sutherland, in punishing criminals, society expresses the same urge which is expressed by the criminal in committing crime. Injuries and wrongs frequently incite a spontaneous, instinctive wrath and anger. In the evolution of punishment, more stress was laid on social revenge. Society is outraged at an act of involuntary perversity and indignantly retaliated. Even with these criticisms, however, the retributive principle of lex talonis and proportionality of sanctions remains a dominant justification of punishment in most Western cultures. The dictum of let the punishment fit the crime also has some appeal as a principled, proportional and commensurate form of societal revenge for various types of misconduct. However, modern legal system has given up the vengeance theory because of its heinous, barbaric and uncivilized nature of punishment. Utilitarian theories of punishment where punishment is awarded to reduce crime and used as a means to an end is the claim of the utilitarians. The underlying assumptions of these theories is that crime must be prevented as economically in terms of the suffering of the offender as possible. The objectives of punishment according to this theory is to make the guilty man or the offender a better person and by extension the community better. To improve society by either isolating or reforming the offender. The utilitarians justify punishment only if it can be shown to be of some utility to the society. It is a curative theory. It is supported by thinkers such as Plato, Aristotle and Mahatma Gandhi who actually saw punishment as a bitter pill that would cure 
all criminal tendencies. The penalty of wrongdoing is a debt which offender owes to his victim. When punishment has been endured, the debt is paid. The liability is extinguished. The doctrine of just desert is based on principle that criminals having committed crime in the past deserve to be punished. George Hegel and Immanuel Kant criticized and rejected the utility theory, presented the contrast, the retributive theory of punishment, which is of non-utilitarian on the premises that punishment is not a means to an end, but an end in itself. This tug of war between George Hegel and Immanuel Kant on one side and Jeremy Bentham on the other side was carried out even by 20th century scholars. The deterrent theory. Plateau argued that punishment is a benefit to the person because it improves their soul or character. Jeremy Bentham, the classical advocate of utilitarian punishment, believed that punishment could be calibrated to debtor crime. His idea of a hedonistic calculus involved two concepts. First, that mankind was essentially rational and hedonistic, that is pleasure seeking, and would seek to maximize pleasure and minimize pain in all behavior decisions. And second, that a legal system could accurately determine exactly what measure of punishment was necessary to slightly outweigh the potential pleasure or profit from any criminal act. Thus, if done correctly, the potential pain of punishment would be sufficient to outweigh the potential pleasure or profit from crime. And all people would rationally choose to be law-abiding. Under the utilitarian rationale, punishment is evil, but it is justified when punishment accomplishes more good than evil it represents. Cesar Beccaria, another utilitarian thinker, suggested that in some instances the benefits of punishment do not outweigh the evil. Deterrent punishment is in fact based on the doctrine of freedom of the will, according to which a person is free to do as he pleases. Society should therefore try to discipline him and to bring his behavior into conformity with generally accepted standards by giving him deterrent punishment for violating laws. There are two equally important elements to this view. First, that society has a right to punish and second, that the criminal has the right to be punished. The right of society to punish is said to lie in the social contract. Although this idea dates back to the ancient Greeks, it gained its greatest currency during the Age of Enlightenment, that is in the 17th and 18th centuries and is associated with Thomas Hobbes who wrote Levithian in 1651 and John Locke whose two treaties on government in 1690 and Jean Jacques Rousseau whose social contract theory is based on. Basically the concept proposes that all people freely and willingly enter into an agreement to form society by giving up a portion of their individual freedom for the return benefit of protection. If one transgresses against the rights of others, one has broken the social contract and society has the right to punish. Noted criminologist Sutherland divided this theory into two categories, general deterrence and specific deterrence. Now deterrence has two purposes, to restrain the wrongdoer from repeatedly indulging in crime and secondly, to set an example for others to deter and prevent them from committing the crimes or violating the laws. So specific deterrence relates to a particular individual. There are two central issues concerning deterrence, individual and general. Now for individual deterrence, this involves punishments having a direct impact on the offender who has committed the offense. This is clearly a psychological approach. While general deterrence is applied to the whole community, that is as a method of social control. 
For being in 1981, individual deterrence is directly linked to physical freedoms, to conditioning, and individual fear calculus. The desire to offend is kept in check by the fear of the consequences should the person be caught. The rationality of the offender is emphasized in this approach, with the offender deciding that the pleasure of crime cannot outweigh the pain of imprisonment. Beyond serving the above-mentioned purposes, punishment is designed to educate and therefore to reform the criminals subjected to it. It is also maintained that punishment reforms criminals and that it does by creating fear of repetition of the punishment. General deterrence. Punishment is designed to deter future crime by making an example of each defendant, thus frightening citizens so much that they will not dare to do what the defendant did. General deterrence is applied to the whole community, that is, as a method of social control. Central to this is the social fear calculus. It works in a similar way to the individual fear calculus. But the individual is not subjected to the pain himself. Rather, the individual sees the pain of others and is deterred from the activity that led to it because he or she does not want to be subjected to such suffering. It relates to wider social relations and although directed against an individual, is intended to have implications beyond per the person who is actually punished. As Beccaria insisted, for punishment to positively affect future behavior, there must be a relatively high degree of certainty that punishment will follow a criminal act. The punishment must be administered very soon after the act and it must be painful. Uh, General deterrence, Radawanskik and King put it, people are not sent to prison primarily for their own good or even in the ho hope that they will be cured of crime. It is used as a warning and a deterrent to others. The threat of punishment for law violators deters a large but unknown number of individuals who might commit crime if no such system existed. Deterrence theory faces the criticism that people really are not deterred from committing crime because of bounded rationality. Does a person think that he will be punished or do people get the message that punishment is being given and they should not commit a crime? Man is limited by bounded rationality. You cannot weigh all the pros and cons. But deterrence is definitely being followed and is one of the main objectives of punishment. In fact, many laws are made to deter the criminals. And the third aim of philosophy is of incapacitation, that you put the offenders, the persons who are a threat to society behind the bars, so that you incapacitate them from protecting the others as such. Incapacitation serves no real purpose except for protection of society. And one of the most progressive theories has been the theory of reformation which looks at reforming the individual, reforming the offender who has committed the crime and not just merely punishing him. It has been a theory which requires that prisons move from places of punishment to places of reformation and correction. It focuses on the future behavior of the person in changing his outlook, his attitude and his values as such. It requires a whole range of efforts from the state to reform offenders and not just merely locking up persons. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi had said that crime is the outcome of a diseased mind and prisons must be places like hospitals. So, but a re a reformation itself again is a very, very difficult and a very, very challenging task. All criminals cannot be reformed, all offenders cannot have correctional philosophy being applied to them. For example, it may not work on psychopaths. It may not work on terrorists maybe at times. Reformation has been emphasized by the Supreme Court of India 
in a number of judgments, particularly by Justice Krishna Iyer and Sunil Batra case, where they had said that prisons must be reformation, places of reformation. So all these theories of punishment, the philosophies of punishment are important and they have been emphasized in different laws. In fact, the law on juvenile justice also focused both on deterrence and reformation. Retribution, atonement, deterrence, protection, rehabilitation, they are all treatments, all different philosophies which justify punishment to the offenders. In fact, right now we are having a lot of focus on reintegration of offenders because people will not be locked up perpetually. They will go back into society. So the recent trend that the object of punishment has been considerably changed. There are different ways and processes and if we find that there has been a change as the state has become more of a welfare state and now there is an increased understanding of the social and psychological causes of crime which has led to a growing emphasis on reformation rather than deterrence. In fact, even imprisonment is being used to a lesser extent in some countries and we find that uh, countries like uh, Norway instance are in fact focusing more on other alternatives to imprisonment and this trend has also been reflected towards restorative justice which is a relatively new philosophy where the focus is not on just punishing the offenders but as John Brathwaite had observed that it is has been utilized obviously in the ancient civilizations as well where we look at also uh, making repent to the victim some recompensation to the victim and promoting healing and repairing the harm that has been done by the offender and promoting a victim offender mediation as such. So one of the major differences between traditional justifications of punishment that is retribution, deterrence and rehabilitation and incapacitation and restorative justice is that the state or legal governing body does not always play a central part. In restorative justice it can often take the shape of victim offender mediation and peace circles and other community initiatives that provide alternatives to the traditional incarceration model. And this places the control of penalization back into the hands of those who are most affected by the crime. And we find this change in terms of restitution for the community, in terms of community service, which is sometimes made as a part of the sentencing process. The victims movement has become particularly important in the late 90s where victims are being provided uh, with voices that are heard. Uh, Garland and others suggest that the ideas and justifications of punishment are not static. They are not static because the moral understanding is also a reflection of the current cultural values that are also greatly influenced by social structures. Justifications of crime tend to evolve, they tend to change and oftentimes blend largely as a result of current political climate. So punishment should not be just directed towards the good of society but also the individual. So punishment is the proper immediate consequence of the criminal act. It's a stage in the criminal justice system. It should be administered in such a way that criminals reconciliation to the community is not impeded. Perhaps in the future, while imposing punishments, authorities should consider this point of view. Thank you.